It's time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Our students are struggling. Underfunding of our education system is impacting our kids directly with oversized classrooms, with fewer in-school supports, and anxiety levels are at an all-time high. None of this is normal. Would the Premier explain how a measly $66 per student is going to address the massive problems their chronic underfunding has created? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are proud to increase investment for the coming school year by $693 million more dollars per September. Ten, that is a 10% increase in funding, 10% increase in funding for school boards the last four years. When you look at the entire Ministry of Education budget, it is up 27% when compared to the peak of spending under Premier Kathleen Wynne. That is an investment in our publicly funded schools. Now, Madam Speaker, we just announced a commitment to hire a thousand more teachers focused on literacy and math, a thousand additional teachers focused on de streaming. And I know that the members opposite will continue to oppose measures that incrementally make a difference in schools. They have an opportunity today to vote for our budget and our new plan to improve schools, to expect better from our school boards, and to demand that our education leads to student achievement and better outcomes Fonts? in reading, writing, and math. Vote for our budget, vote for our investments. Vote for better in Ontario schools. Supplementary question. Speaker, the education funding that was announced yesterday doesn't even remotely keep pace with inflation, let alone address the three years of learning disruption that have been impacting our kids so deeply. So if they're not investing in our students and their future, what are they doing? They're micromanaging school boards, they're labeling community schools as real estate assets, and they're introducing new fees. That's what they're doing, Speaker. Back to the Premier. If he isn't going to invest in schools, will he at least not stick them with the bill for ministry responsibilities? Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, from health care to housing to education, the status quo defender here in the Leader of the Opposition, defending the status quo when we all know we can do better for our children and they deserve better in Ontario schools. We introduced legislation that is premised on raising standards, increasing accountability, and enshrining the voice of parents in our education system. What about that is so offensive to the Leader of the Opposition? What about making sure that we have better outcomes tied to student achievement so we actually see higher outcomes related to reading, writing, and math? What is offensive about ensuring that we build schools faster, that we certify new educators quicker? What is offensive about ensuring that new teachers are better educated on math, on literacy, on mental health, and special education. But it is opposition systematically to progress and to change. We will stand up for kids and drive this legislation forward. The final supplementary. Speaker, when is this government going to start taking responsibility? Five years. Five years. The status quo is their terrible record. That's right. It's the same old story that we've heard from this minister and this government for years now, and that's how out of touch they are. They're micromanaging municipalities. They're ideologically dismantling public health care. And now they're grabbing power from school boards. I don't know a parent or a teacher in this province who trusts this government to deliver quality education Order. to our children. Order. Inside, come to order. I mean, just look at the state of education in this province right now. Order. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. But we see it every day. Back to the Premier. His plan is going to force the layoffs of teachers and education workers across this province. Will he reverse course and invest in the supports that students need to thrive? Of education to respond. It is ironic, re recognizing that in the last election, the New Democrats lost 800,000, 300,000 votes for the people of Ontario. 
So when you want to talk about public Order. confidence, we have a mandate to demand better for Ontario children. There are 83 progressive conservatives, a historic achievement because the people of Ontario have confidence in our Premier and in our party to stand up for parents Order. and to demand better from the system of education. We are increasing the hiring by 2,000 more frontline staff. We are refocusing our system of education on what matters most. Back to the basics. Back to ensuring young people have the fluency in the skills that will help to set them up for long-term success. Madam Speaker, the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite speaks about mental health. In this budget, we've increased it by 500 percent, over $100 million, Spons? a significant increase to help children succeed. We're going to continue to drive reform and demand better for Ontario children. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. On Thursday, the Ombudsman's Office released their latest report on child welfare agencies in the province. We heard about Misty, a 13-year-old Indigenous girl from Northern Ontario who repeatedly went missing while living in a home operated by Johnson Children's Services, which, as many of you already know, is a private provider. They were found to be particularly remiss in their obligations to provide care to Misty. The Ombudsman made 58 recommendations. As a result, 31 of them were directed toward Johnson Children's Services. So, Speaker, my question is very simple. What does the Premier plan to do to act on the important recommendations of the Ombudsman? During community and social services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable uh, Colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. There is absolutely no room whatsoever in our system for individuals, entities, or organizations that either willfully or through neglect fail in their duty of care towards children, Mr. Speaker. Every single child in our province, Mr. Speaker, whether they're in care or not, deserve the right to live in peace and safety. And I'm glad to be able to share, Mr. Speaker, that all three organizations that were at the centre of the Ombudsman report have accepted all 58 recommendations uh, from the Ombudsman, Mr. Speaker. But it's critical that although these five, uh, all the 58 recommendations are, need to be implemented swiftly so that something like this never happens again across this province, Mr. Speaker. And while none of these uh, uh, recommendations are directed at the uh, or, to, or directed towards the Ministry Response. of Children, Community, Social Services, we will nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, use this report to inform the continuing work of redesigning child welfare across the province. The supplementary question. I want to go back to the Premier on this one. Um, it's a very important question. Misty went missing seven times while she was in Johnson Children's Services care. At one point, the staff waited to report Misty missing to the police for more than four hours, and that resulted in her disappearance for 19 days. 19 days, Speaker. I want everyone in this House to imagine a child going missing for 19 days. What's worse, Johnson was being paid to provide her with one-on-one -on -one support. The Ombudsman found they failed to provide this level of care. He also found significant gaps in documentation, in record-keeping, and training practices. Speaker, Johnson Children's Services failed Misty. To the Premier, why are private providers with documented negligence still allowed to operate in Ontario? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The events outlined in the Ombudsman report are absolutely unacceptable, and there will be absolutely no room and zero tolerance, Mr. Speaker. As I said, every single child, every single youth in our province deserves to have a safe and loving home, regardless of whether they're in care, Mr. Speaker. Again, the three organizations in the case have accepted all 58 recommendations. But we are asking and we will make sure that all 58 recommendations are uh, implemented swiftly, Mr. Speaker, so that this never happens to a single child or youth across the province. And, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of this Premier Ford, as I said from day one, no children, no child or youth will ever be left behind. We'll make sure that never happens. And the final supplementary. Minister talks about zero tolerance. Why are they still operating in this province? to the Premier again. It's clear. Private providers like Johnson Children's Services have not been meeting the complex needs of marginalized children in care. 
The circumstances of Misty's life put her uniquely at risk. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls specifically addresses, and I'm going to quote, the obligation of the child welfare system to protect Indigenous children from exploitation. But it seems like this is not a priority for the Premier and his government. How is the Premier going to ensure there are resources for Northern communities to provide culturally appropriate services so children like Misty can receive the support and the protection they need and that every child every child deserves. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I thank the member for, uh, for the question. And as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, the report, uh, the, uh, the events that are outlined in the report are unacceptable. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to point out that just last week, uh, I was uh, up north with, with the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and, and my co a colleague from Kewitnam uh, in a signing of a coordination agreement to support the exercise of the Kichinim and Kusip in Inuwag. Uh, a, jur a jurisdiction that would give them jurisdiction over child and family services <laughs> under the Kido Agreement of Family Law. Mr. Speaker, I will add once again that we have made sure that the services that are being provided need to be safe and secure, and every single child and every single youth in this, in this province needs to be supported. Now, Mr. Speaker, this comes as a result of many years of neglect by the previous government, Spons? which always, every single time, Order. Mr. Speaker, the NDP had the opportunity to Order. do something about it. They didn't. Opposition come to order. Under this government, under this Premier, we'll make sure that, once again, no one is left behind, not a single child. Order. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Last week, the Obmetman released a report on the failure of three care agencies to ensure the safety of First Nations girl who repeatedly went missing and when uh, she was supposed to be receiving supervised services. This young woman should not have been harmed while under this, under this care. What has this minister done to hold these child welfare agencies accountable for all the evidence that tells us they're not doing their jobs? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Once again, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Speaker. Very clearly, again, uh, the uh, events that are outlined in the Ombudsman report are absolutely unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. It's very clear. And as I mentioned, every single child, every single youth in our province needs to be in a safe and loving environment, a stable home, again, regardless of whether they're in care, Mr. Speaker. The Ombudsman's uh, report is, is going to be helpful as we are embarking on a child uh, welfare redesign across the province. Once again, Mr. Speaker, let me be very, very, very clear. Not a single children, not a child or youth in this province is going to go uh, through neglect. We're not going to let it happen. We will fight for them every single day and make sure that those that are responsible are always held to account, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, um, you should shut down Johnson because it's children that pay full with their lives when you do not take action, when you just speak those words that you're speaking. Speaker, uh, the provincial uh, protection system is perpetually responding to crisis instead of fixing the, the root issues. Mm -hmm. Their focus should be on keeping families whole and healthy and on issues that create the crisis, such as housing, parenting, wellness, food security, and poverty. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, what does this government plan to do to act on the important recommendation of the Ombudsman? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, the three organizations involved in, in the case, Mr. Speaker, have accepted 
all 58 recommendations of the Ombudsman report and we'll make sure that they are uh, acted on swiftly and implemented, Mr. Speaker, so that this never happens again to a single child or youth. Mr. Speaker, I want to also add this is why the child welfare redesign is in the process. We're, in the, we're now consulting with those because we want to make sure that this never happens to a single child or youth in the province, Mr. Speaker. That includes Order. more oversight uh, across the province. Once again, Mr. Speaker, this is as a result of neglect for many, many years. We didn't do anything about it, Mr. Order. Speaker. It's not going to happen. Official on opposition, come We'll make sure that we'll work every single Response. day to protect every single child and youth in our province, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kitchener-Conestoga. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Waterloo Region is home to some of the best and brightest healthcare and technology researchers in the world, making this an ideal location for innovative companies that are looking to start up and expand. It should come as no surprise there is such extensive knowledge, skills and expertise found here, Mr. Speaker, as our region is also home to a number of highly respected post-secondary institutions. Ontario's life sciences sector is essential to advancing innovative healthcare solutions and is also vital to building our competitive economy. Our government must continue to demonstrate support for this sector in order to ensure that Ontario, Ontario remains a leading force in new innovative health technologies and job creation. Speaker, can the Premier please explain what our government is doing to foster innovation in the health technology sector? And to reply, the Premier. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank our all-star MPP from Kitchener, Conestoga, for the important question and, and for hosting us, along with the other MPPs in the Waterloo region. And I brought some real all-star uh, ministers, Minister of Colleges and University, and my good pal, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and, and Trade. We did an incredible announcement over in uh, Kitchener at uh, University of Waterloo. It was a $7.5 million to help build a state-of-the-art innovation arena at the University of Waterloo. And Mr. Speaker, you see these students. They're coming up with the brightest and greatest ideas. They're blazing a new trail when it comes to life sciences. We've seen over $3 billion of investment in the life science sector right here in Ontario. We're leading, at, we're leading the country. We're leading uh, global. Uh, we're, we're leading globally with life sciences. Come Companies are coming in here by the droves because we have the brightest and best students anywhere in the world, right here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, thank you again, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Premier uh, for that response. This announcement is great news that will help to create good paying jobs, attract new investments, and elevate the profile of Kitchener and, of course, Waterloo Region as a leading uh, region in tech and innovation. Under the leadership of the Premier, this investment is just one of the many ways that our government is building a strong Ontario for a resilient economy today, but also for the future, Mr. Speaker. However, it is, it is essential that our government continues to be forward-thinking and continues to adopt Ontario-made innovations that will improve our healthcare sector. Speaker, can the Premier please elaborate on how this investment in Waterloo Region is part of our government's broader strategy to develop innovative solutions to improve the lives of all Ontarians? The Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the member for that uh, question. When we went to Kitchener-Waterloo region, one of the fastest growing regions anywhere in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, we were there to support the life science strategy that we've put together. The strategy is the first of its kind in over a decade, and it's uh, serving as a roadmap to establish Ontario's life science leader. Mr. Speaker, I always say government doesn't create jobs. We create the environment and the conditions and the climate for companies to invest. And as I mentioned earlier, over $3 billion have been invested. Just to name a few, Omnia Bio, 250 jobs, a 200,000 square foot building right in Hamilton. They're a bio manufacturing company. You heard about the AstraZeneca, 500 jobs. What a great announcement. Roche, another 500 jobs. Sanofi, 300 jobs. Mr. Speaker, that's just to name a few. Again, they know Ontario is a place to invest in. They know we have the best talent in the world. We've cut red tape and regulations over $700 million. We've cut $8 billion off the backs of companies to attract. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, Maison McCulloch is Sudbury's hospice. I met with uh, Executive Director Julie Olbe 
and I was shocked to hear the hospice must rely on donations just to stay afloat. This is not normal, Speaker. Julie told me how critical their 50-50 draw is because the Conservative government's budget doesn't spell out new money for any specific palliative care operations in Ontario. She said, it is time hospices be recognized for the vital role they play in the healthcare system and start being funded like an equal clinic healthcare institution. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier finally recognize the vital role hospices play in the healthcare system and will he start funding them like an equal clinic healthcare institution? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the, uh, the member opposite is right when he talks about the value and importance of palliative care and hospice in our, our province. In fact, in our Your Health document, we laid, we laid out very specifically our commitment to expand hospice and palliative care in the province of Ontario because we see it as a really important part of our health care continuum. And in fact, in our 2023-24 budget, our government is expanding palliative care to uh, services in local communities, adding 23 new hospice beds to the 500 that already exist in the province of Ontario. There is no doubt that hospice and palliative care are an important community partner in our health care system, and we will continue to support and fund them appropriately. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Cybersecurity Hospice has to raise $1.6 million every year to operate. So the announcement from the minister that they're going to open more hospice means that there's more fundraising required to operate. $1.6 million. This isn't for fancy experts, Speaker. Extras. This fundraising is needed for meal prep, for housekeepers, for cleaning supplies. Imagine worrying every single month that you won't raise enough money to keep residents fed and cared for in their final stages of life. And the fear is justified because last month it was reported the hospice was relying on food banks to feed their patients. Wow. Food banks. This is a shameful speaker. This is not normal and this is not acceptable. My question, will the Conservative government increase the funding so that hospices like Maison McCulloch do not have to rely on food banks, fundraisers and community donations to feed and care for their patients? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, hospice are a really in integral and engaged community uh, asset that many of us have the pleasure of participating and being part of. And by doing that, community members have historically always stepped up to support. In my own community, Bethel Hospice was Order. founded by one Order. family who saw the need and ultimately funded and formed a residential hospice that frankly is world leading Order. in the region of Peel. We do this in our community because we want to give back, we want to support these very important services. And yes, the province of Ontario will continue to support and fund hospice and palliative care, but we're doing it with the support and commitment of the communities they serve. Thank you. The next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Who's going to ask the other question? Her. Job creation is great. I want to thank the Minister for visiting my riding yesterday and the City of London. Um, it was truly wonderful to see area manufacturers announce their important expansions. Speaker, Ontario's world-class manufacturing sector employs over 660,000 workers and is the lifeline of our province's regional economies. That's why we've taken the right steps to attract investment, all the while growing the economy and creating new, good and sustainable jobs. But to remain competitive, our manufacturers and businesses need a government that will work with them. Speaker, can the minister highlight how our government is once again supporting the manufacturing sector and talk about the expansions in my riding in the City of London? Thank you to the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London for that great tour yesterday. Together we welcomed over $14 million in new investments from two area manufacturing firms. Yeah, great. Work, Rob. Edge Automation builds massive machinery, Speaker, for companies to automate their businesses. They're investing over $5 million to expand their facility. The, the facility is well under construction, and they're buying really innovative equipment. They're creating 12 jobs along the way. But 
we went over to St. Thomas and saw Takumi stamping. They, now, they manufacture auto parts over there. They're investing $9 million. They get a $1.3 million injection from the province. They're expanding that current facility and creating 65 brand new, really good paying jobs. Speaker, this is how we're supporting Ontario's manufacturing sector. Please supplement your question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. When the previous Liberal government announced that Ontario's economy would shift away from goods producing to service producing sectors, they spurred an exodus of jobs from this province. The 300,000 manufacturing jobs that were sent running from Ontario came as a surprise to no one, and they left causing damage to economically to our communities. Programs like the Regional Development Program has been a game changer for manufacturing and new job creation throughout Ontario. And it's long overdue that both businesses and families receive their fair share of support. Speaker, can the minister explain what our government is doing from previous governments to support business growth and long-term job creation? Minister of Economic Development. You know, Speaker, since we got elected, our government has put all the pieces in place to create the environment, as Premier Ford just said, to create 600,000 jobs in the province of Ontario. But, but Speaker, we got there with absolutely no help from the Liberals or the NDP. Think about the fact that they voted against every single thing that we put in place to create jobs and help families. They voted against every skilled trade enhancement we put to help people prepare for the jobs of the future. They voted against every infrastructure investment, whether it's roads or bridges or highways, to get these people to work. They voted against every single lowering of taxes for families to help save money. They, lowered, they voted against every housing initiative Spons. so people have a place to live. Speaker, they voted against every time we lowered the price of energy. Speaker, who the heck does that? Order. The next question. The member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. According to Feed Ontario, food bank use remains at an all-time high in Ontario. There has been an increase in food bank use of 42% over the last three years and a 47% increase in people with employment accessing food banks since the Conservatives foreign government in 2018. Yeah. One in four people using a food bank are children living in poverty in this Premier's Ontario. Two out of three people who access food banks are social assistance recipients. People in my riding and across Ontario are struggling to provide food for themselves and their family. Speaker, this is not normal. Will the Premier commit today to at least doubling ODSP and OW rates and stop legislating poverty? Next question, the Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, uh, and Mr. Speaker, through you to the member opposite. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's no question that many are feeling the pinch in this province and many are hurting and our government understands that uh, taxpayers are under pressure, Mr. Speaker, and, and that's why you know, we acted quickly last year to uh, improve uh, the cost of living for many in this province. We didn't wait, but let me, let, me, let me just acknowledge a few other things while we're at it. You know, why don't I acknowledge the Minister of Energy? who reduced energy costs so that people could afford Fantastic. electricity prices. Why don't, why don't I acknowledge the Minister of Com uh, Colleges and Universities who froze tuition to make it more affordable for many people in Ontario? Well, I'm at it, Mr. Speaker. Why don't I congratulate the Minister of Education? The Minister of Education that is providing childcare for people right across the province so they can take their kids to school and have a world-class education. Stop the clock. I wish to inform the House that we have had a fire alarm in the basement and it is currently being investigated. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, provide more information as we have. Order. I, I can't. The tunnel. Start the clock. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. It's absolutely shameful that the uh, minister stood there applauding his government when my colleague from Sudbury just talked about the hospice there having to fundraise or their people, their patients having to use food banks. Speaker, between January and September 2022, the number of people visiting a food bank increased by 24 per cent. First-time visitors increased by 64 per cent. Uh, one in three of those people have never had to use a food bank before. Wow. Food banks are concerned that the need may outpace the capacity of the provincial food bank network. This is an unprecedented crisis. This is not normal. After five years in government, the Conservatives should be absolutely ashamed of the consistent increase in the number of people living in poverty. Speaker, can the Premier explain why he and his members applaud themselves for making life more affordable when, in fact, more and more Order. Ontarians Question. are living in poverty under their watch? Yep. The Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, perhaps the uh, member opposite could explain why they have not supported any of the measures that we've put on this side of the house and over there to reduce the cost of living order. for many in this province. Now, Mr. Speaker, opposition come to order. You know, there's no question that uh, some people and many are, are hurting, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, they should look perhaps to their support for a carbon tax, because you know what a carbon tax does. A carbon tax puts the burden on many families across the province. A carbon tax actually increases food prices in this province, Mr. Speaker. Now, inflation came down this morning from 5.2% to 4.3%, almost a full point this morning. Still too high, and that's why this government took action before. That's why this government continues to take action and will Response. go in the forward to help the people of Ontario. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to see you as always. My question, or er, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Ontario Place was originally created as a place to reaffirm our identity as Ontarians and Canadians, with many of us having special and fond memories from being there. The space is now used by many as a beautiful outdoor public space to make more memories with friends, family and the community, as well as the natural, the birds, the insects and animal life. What has happened to the Ontario in Ontario Place? What has been an attraction to celebrate Ontario through design, materials, landscape and programming is now going to feature an Austrian spa franchise, Therme. Even the West Island entrance is to be rebranded as Thermae. Question. Can the minister please explain how she believes an expensive privately owned spa developed by an Austrian corporation represents the identities of Ontarians? The parliamentary assistant and member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government is bringing Ontario Place back to life, making it a remarkable world-class year-round destination that will include family-friendly entertainment, public and event spaces, parkland, and waterfront access. Once completed, Mr. Speaker, Ontario Place will be open for 365 days a year and welcome from 4 to 6 million visitors annually. Mr. Speaker, this site is in the process of redevelopment and the site preparation is underway, and this project will create 5,000 jobs with 3,000 construction jobs and 2,500 permanent jobs. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the, this afternoon's announcement with Premier and Minister Sarma. Thank you. Order. Order. Right. Supplementary question. Back to Chazice York. Ontario is, as we know, open for business, Mr. Speaker. We want to support our local economy and be a destination for people across the world. I agree, it's a great idea to create new attractions for both our residents and tourists to enjoy. It should be somewhere Order. that is affordable and accessible and represents representative of who we are as Ontarians. It really makes me wonder, why Thermae? How was this decision even made? My question to the Minister 
but the parliamentary assistance is, um, is since the minister is not here, is what other options? Oops. I'm going to ask the member not to make reference to the absence of another member and conclude her question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Heckler. My question to the minister is what other options for the development on the West Island of Ontario Place were considered by the government before they decided on the spa with Therme and why weren't proposals from Ontario, Ontario and even Canada-based companies considered? And then once again, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the redevelopment of Ontario Place is a once-in-a-generation opportunity that will revitalize our beloved waterfront destination and bring tourism, commercial and social benefits to both province and the city. Mr. Speaker, the previous government has left Ontario Place in a state of despair and neglect. Attractions are currently closed and left abandoned while flooding, electrical and plumbing issues are frequent on site. Mr. Speaker, our government will bring Ontario Place back to life and make it an affordable, world-class destination for Ontarios from all corners of the province to come and enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. And, and I just wish to inform the House that um, I've been informed that uh, the fire alarm is turned off and it's all clear. The next question, start the clock. Member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker. I, my question is for the Minister of Education. I want to thank him for coming to the riding of Barry Innisfil, where he heard firsthand from many parents. Parents like Lynn, who is a working mom of five and is also serving as a school trustee locally. And he heard resoundingly that we need to focus on teaching relevant life skills, job skills, things that will help their children succeed, not only in the classroom, but also in today's modern economy. And while our government is actively modernizing course content and providing historic levels of funding, we must also make sure that leadership and governments are at the board level continues to reflect the priorities that will serve our students best. So I want to ask the Minister of speaking to parents not only in Barry and Isville, but all across this province, how we are going to focus on what matters most in our education system and strengthening our education system. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I know as a new parent, uh, a lot of skin in the game to get this right. And so we're working together across our communities to make sure all children succeed. And Mr. Speaker, I want to assure families that we are going to challenge the status quo, lift standards, and expect better for Ontario children. That is something that I believe should unite us all in this legislature. And we're going to start that by increasing investment by $693 million more million next year. We're going to continue to build momentum by hiring 2,000 skilled focused educators when it comes to literacy promotion, mathematics and de-stream courses. We're going to continue to reform the system and part of this plan is to ensure that school board priorities reflect those of parents which we represent. Back to basics, refocusing the system on what matters most on strengthening fundamental foundational skills Spons. of reading, writing and math and other STEM disciplines. We know there's more work to do and we're prepared to do it together to improve our schools for our kids. Supplementary question. I want to thank the Minister for that great response and really listening to all Ontarians. I know our government is focused on student achievement and will help to improve results in many areas. And, but when it comes to students and their achievement and their experience in schools, we can all agree that a great teacher makes a big difference in the classroom. And I think growing up of Mr. Jeans, Ms. Gillis, Madame Potven, you know, top educators who are the ones who really connect well with students that are able to teach relevant life skills, job skills, and critical thinking skills. In order to uphold our commitment for students to succeed, it is our government's responsibility to ensure that educators are equipped, qualified, and available to teach fundamental subjects that are essential to changing the world. Speaker, I want to ask the Minister, can he elaborate on how our government is supporting our educators so that they are best equipped to meet the needs of the future? Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Barry Isville for this question. As the Premier often says, we have among the best educators in the country. We're proud of what they do. We want to set them up for long-term success. We frankly want to continue to invest in their development. And so, Madam, Mr. Speaker, right now a problem we are committed to fixing is the faculties of education currently have no requirement to work with the College of Teachers or the Ministry of Education to set out minimum requirements for their professional development and their learning experience. We're now going to be involved with the front end on setting prerequisites related to mental health, special education, the signs of leadership, of literacy promotion according to the new curriculum, and of course a mathematical competence. That is what a modern teacher should look like. It's what we are endeavouring to do. It's what we're going to do through this bill. We're also going to literally reduce the amount of days by half that it takes a process to certify a new educator, a highly talented person from around the world or at home. We're going to do it quicker. And finally, Mr. Speaker, we take a zero tolerance when it comes to crimes against children by ensuring they are lifetime banned from teaching in this province. And the next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On April 1st, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services cut the complex special needs funding for nursing and PSW supports, which families with medically fragile children need to hire their support. These cuts impact approximately 100 families who have some of the most medically fragile children in the province. These cuts happened without warning, and no transition plans were provided to these families. This is completely unacceptable and must be reinstated immediately. Can the Premier explain why this essential funding was cut, why there was no transition plan provided for families, and how his government plans to address this? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm, I'm very pleased that I have the opportunity to talk about an announcement that was made uh, just last month in Hamilton at the McMaster Children's Hospital. And it's a three-year pilot project called Integrated Pathways for Children. It was lauded, it was celebrated by families and by clini clinicians because they understand that children with special needs have unique challenges, and that may be mental health concerns, developmental disabilities, or chronic conditions. And now with this integrated pathway for children, speaker, it's going to connect those highly individualized care programs that are so important and so critical for those families into Bloorview, Holland Bloorview in Toronto, McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, and CHEO in Ottawa. Really, really exciting program, and I've already said that if this three-year pilot ends up being successful, it will no longer be a pilot. We will make sure it's a crossing tip. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. One of the families is Nicole, whose daughter Alexa receives funding through the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. This has allowed Alexa to receive the nearly 24 hours of ICU care at home, which she requires. These cuts will result in service gaps, which her mother will be left to fill, because the ministries are working in silos instead of working together. Alexa is palliative speaker. Her family should not be wasting their precious time jumping through hoops with this government. Can the Premier commit to ensuring that ministries will start to work together to find long-term solutions for families with medically fragile children so that they can get the care they need when they need it? I trust the member opposite has connected that family with the McMaster Children's Hospital to ensure that they are part of the integrated pathway for children because as I said it is exactly what families and clinicians have been asking for we are funding through the 97 million dollar investment a three-year pilot project with those three community agencies and you know we are working more closely together with ministries within government than we have ever seen. And it is exactly why we want to be able to offer programs for the families. This is not about funding organizations. This is about ministries working together to make sure that those families do not have to go through multiple doors Order. to look after their children. Thank you, Speaker. Order. Stop the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Member for Brampton North, come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. 
Speaker, if we believe there's a housing crisis, shouldn't we be thinking hard and planning for smart growth? I'm worried about this line from the proposed new provincial planning statement uh, from the Environmental Registry, quote, municipalities would be allowed to create new settlement areas and would not be required to demonstrate the need for expansion. This government is continuing to encourage thoughtless sprawl and not thinking about affordability, whether it's in the cost of new infrastructure required or the longer term cost of living in urban sprawl. For example, the goal to, quote, shorten commute journeys and decrease transportation congestion is left out of the new provincial planning statement. Speaker, why does this government want to bake in an older, more expensive and unsustainable way of providing housing? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, well, Speaker, let's think for a second what the opposition means when they talk about sprawl. It means they don't pe think that people should be living in some of our fastest growing communities. Think about young people who want to live in the community that they grew up in. Think about the NIMBY style politics that the opposition continues to cater to. We on this side of the house have a fundamental disagreement with that type of politics. We don't, we believe you should not be talking down Ontario. We believe that all parts of Ontario should be a place to grow, to grow your family, to grow your business, and grow your community. That's the type of policies we're going to bring forward. Here. A supplementary question? Well, Speaker, here's another problem with municipalities creating new settlement areas without being required to demonstrate the need for expansion. This change in the provincial planning statement has the potential to create a green belt palooza across the province. If you don't worry about a rationale for urban expansion, then these decisions become more political. The government is encouraging the business model of buying up land and then trying to influence elected officials to expand settlement areas onto their land, thereby delivering the hope for windfall profit. Speaker, if you thought developers buying greenbelt land just before it was taken out and given to development smelled bad, allowing thoughtless urban expansion could create a province-wide green belt of palooza that makes stag and doe look like a tea party. <laughs> Response. Speaker, I, I want to remind Ontarians what this member and his party talk about. They're against farmers being able to sever uh, a lot for their son or daughter. They're against that. Just like they were against agriculture when they were in power. Remember uh, Kathleen Wynne closing in my riding an agricultural college that, that froze out all of Eastern Ontario. Remember that. Remember that type of policy. You know, Speaker, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote from the Toronto Star today that talks about permits to build new Ontario condos soar by 25% as new policies speed up the We've seen a 13.6% increase in February compared to January for multi-dwelling permits. That's the type of success that our housing supply action plan continues to build upon. Again, the Liberal Party that did nothing for 15 years when they were in the balance of power. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation, who's constantly getting uh, our people moving. Barry Innisfil is home to an exciting transit-oriented community project. We're going to create more housing, but it's also home to people who, over 80% of which, commute to get to work. They rely on the GO Train network that connects the Barry South Station to Union Station to downtown Toronto. Unfortunately, riders on the Barry GO Train continue to experience growing delays due to increased traffic at the Davenport Crossing. This, Speaker, is one of the busiest at-grade crossing stations in North America, creating a bottleneck of not just rail tracks impacting both freight rail but also GO train services. That is why it's critical for our government to show leadership in taking action to address this long-standing rail problem. So I want to ask the Associate Minister uh, of Transportation how he's bringing hope, real investment and leadership on the progress our government is making on this particular train. To respond, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This government has a lot of love for Barry Innisfil and for that member who does great work and asks a great question. 
Speaker, I'm very happy to, ta to say that two weeks ago we finished major construction of the Davenport Diamonds beautiful new elevated guideway that now lifts the Barry Go Line above freight train tracks. That's not all, Speaker. Go trains are now traveling along this game-changing piece of infrastructure, which will reduce con congestion uh, for the, one of the busiest train intersections in all of North America. Wow. There's more, Speaker. This guideway also provides pedestrians and cyclists with more terrific connections by enabling Go trains to seamlessly travel above existing traffic. Speaker, our government is delivering outstanding Go expansion upgrades across the Barry Line so Spons? riders can get to work, critical services and back home with speed and ease. The opposition did nothing for the people of Barry Innisfil. This government's getting it done. Supplementary question. Thank you to the minister for his hard work. It's welcome news to all uh, folks in Barry Innisfil, especially when I talk to people like Tina and Kyle and Nick who commute five days a week uh, to come to work uh, here in the GTA. But speaker, transit infrastructure is vital and the GO train network is important to get people connected to all communities and to their work. Across the Golden Horseshoe as a whole, reliable and convenient transit services is essential and the population is expected to increase and over the next three decades, increasing the demand on our transit services and the upgrades that are needed now to ensure that frequency and convenience services is there for years to come. We can't afford to delay or hold back transit investment, Speaker. Our government must deliver on our commitment to bring relief and new opportunities to transit users and, commu and commuters. So, Speaker, I'd like to ask the Associate Minister, can you please elaborate on how our government's investing in expanding the GO Transit Network? Thank you. Associate Minister of Transportation. Well, oh, Speaker, I'm going to elaborate all right. The largest transit expansion plan in Canadian history, over $70 billion to build transit. That includes our transformational GO expansion program. Speaker, the Barry Line stations, we've already finished major upgrades at Rutherford GO station and amazing work is underway to deliver additional platforms and revamped facilities at the Maple, King City and Aurora GO stations. When it comes to the Barry Line Corridor, Speaker, Metrolinx is adding an extra track between Union and Aurora Go to help with the traffic as we watch the Leafs win the Cup this year. <laughs> Speaker, two-way service all day to the Barry Line, every 15 minutes, every day of the week. But our efforts don't just benefit riders, Speaker. In fact, the Go expansion as a whole will generate 8,300 construction and supply chain jobs every single year. Wow. Speaker, the NDP and the Liberals simply didn't build transit when they could have. It's a decade, Spons? Speaker. This government is not only getting shovels in the ground, we're making the rider experience better all along. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is the Premier. Speaker, in the aftermath of the horrific act of Islamophobic violence that took the lives of four members of London's Afzal family in June 2021, the Muslim community in London and across the province came together to develop comprehensive anti-Islamophobia legislation, the Our London Family Act. That bill was tabled last February, but instead of allowing it to be debated, the government referred it to committee, promising to study it and bring it back. Speaker, more than a year later, Islamophobic hate is on the rise. Why is there still no government legislation? Minister of Multiculturalism and Citizenship. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the very important question, and we've had a conversation on this a, a number of times, but Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. Uh, Islamophobia and hate of any kind has no place in Ontario, especially violence, vandalism, or intimidation towards any community group or faith. The rise of Islamophobia uh, motivate incidents, especially during the holy month of Ramadan, is deeply concerning. Our government will always stand shoulder to shoulder with our Muslim community. Speaker, as one of my, in one of my first days as a Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism, I drove out to visit a London Muslim mosque. I personally met with the Imam, the former mayor, and community leaders to discuss how we can work together to fight Islamophobia and make Ontario a safer and more inclusive place for everyone. Our government Response. has and will continue to work with partners of our Muslim community to find community-based centered solutions to make communities stronger, safer, and more vibrant. The supplementary question. 
Speaker, the Muslim community brought a solution to this legislature last year. This government has not passed it. Uh, Speaker, June 6, 2023 will mark two years since the Afzal family so tragically lost their lives, and Muslims in Ontario continue to be targeted and re-traumatized. Last week, following a hateful attack at a, Mar at a Markham mosque, Nadia Hassan from the National Council of Canadian Muslims said, the time for action against Islamophobia is now. We call on the Ontario government to expedite the passing of the Our London Family Act in Ontario. Speaker, this government has had more than a year to study that bill. The official opposition is prepared to pass it. Will this Premier commit to introducing and passing the Our London Family Act before June 6, 2023? <laughs> Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, our government has taken strong action uh, make, and made considerable investments to defend the right of every person in this great province and to, to practice their faith safely and peacefully. With the help of the Anti-Racism Directorate in my ministry, we have allocated over $40 million to enhance security and safety at places of worship and places where cultural communities gather as they build capacity to combat racism and hate. Our government is always providing tools to help police and justice sector prevent, investigate, and prosecute hate crimes through the Hate Crime and Extremism Investigation Team the Hate Crime Investigator Course and Hate Crimes Working Group of Crown Attorneys. We have also taken steps to address racism in schools by creating anti-hate programs and educational resources Spons. to counter Islamophobia, Islamophobia and f all forms of hate. Speaker, we have been taking a whole of government approach to combat hate and we will continue to work with our partners from the Muslim community and all communities. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oxford. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Public Business Service Delivery. As the representative of a growing rural community, I hear from my constituents about the challenges they encounter when accessing government services, including those related to marriage licenses. In rural areas, barriers such as travel and lineups at municipal offices can often be a more prevalent occurrence than in other parts of the province. It's essential that our government continues to modernize processes that make it easier to access government services, including obtaining a marriage license. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is working to ensure that services are convenient and accessible for every Ontarian, regardless of where they live? The Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thanks to the member from uh, Oxford for his uh, question. Speaker, our government understands that there are many Ontarians who face barriers when it comes to accessing government services. Speaker, that is why we are hard at work to modernize how Ontarians access our many new and updated services, including obtaining a marriage license by making it more accessible for new and young couples to apply quickly and conveniently online, regardless of where they live. Speaker, offering online application in six municipalities as part of this new pilot project is just the beginning, as we are quickly seeing the benefits of this change. Couples are now being able to enjoy a faster, more convenient application process Response. that lets them focus more on what matters most to them. Speaker, my ministry is committed to expanding this service province-wide, and I'm looking forward to my colleague... Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and thank to the Minister for the response. My supplementary question is to the Associate Minister of Housing. There's still much more work to be done when it comes to making life better for people across our province. Whether it is newly married couple who want to buy a marriage, to buy a home, or individual and, and families at different stages in their lives, people are experiencing challenges in finding affordable housing. Our government must continue to deliver on our promise to address the housing crisis that is affecting both rural and urban regions. Speaker. 
Can the minister, can the associate minister, please explain how our government is working to address the serious housing shortage situation facing our province? Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I really want to thank the great member for Oxford for his question. Speaker, our government is working to make sure all Ontarians have access to the dream of owning a home. We had close to 100,000 new housing construction starts in 2021, which is the highest in over 30 years, and last year we also surpassed 96,000. This is 30% higher than the annual 65,000 home average over the past 20 years. Pure neglect by the previous right. Liberal government. Right. And in 2022, we saw the most purpose-built rentals on record with almost 15,000 units. And this represents a 7.5% increase from 2021. Through our More Homes for Everyone plan, which the opposition NDP voted against, we've already made changes that will Once. accelerate approval timelines for new housing and protect homeowners from unethical practices. Speaker, as the Premier said yesterday, it's all hands on deck to solve the housing Here. supply crisis. We're working with all Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Health. I've heard from a local nurse on sick leave who has been suffering from debilitating pain connected to endometriosis. Her local OBGYN can't help her because her nerves are affected. She was referred to see a neuropelvic OBGYN, but apparently there's only one in Canada who only works here half the year. She sits on this waiting list, doesn't have an appointment date. She's in bed-bound pain. Once she has the appointment, she may have another ten, uh, 12 to 24 months to wait for the surgery. She has no hope in sight. She has said that a surgeon in the States has quoted her $60,000 for the surgery she needs, but she cannot afford to cover it due to Bill 124 and no wage increases over the last few years in inflation. She says, quote, seems to me the Ontario government should be doing everything possible to keep an experienced nurse at the bedside, yet I am sidelined with debilitating pain and can't get the help I desperately need. What can I do? Because at 33 years old, made is looking pretty tempting, end quote. When will this government fund our hospitals so we can meet the needs of desperate and suffering complex medical patients like this nurse? You know, the member opposite should know that we have, through a surgical recovery fund of almost a billion dollars, um, invested over three years to ensure that surgeries can continue to be expanded, both in hospital as well as, of course, in our community surgical centres. That work has been happening for the last three years, and we've seen, um, in fact, our, our surgery backlogs have gone down to pre-pandemic. But that's not enough, Speaker, and we know it's not enough. So through the Your Health Ontario plan, we've actually uh, mapped out an expansion that will ensure that regular scheduled surgeries that can uh, appropriately happen in community closer to where people live are going to be expanded, and that will ensure that the highly complex surgeries that the member opposite is talking about have the opportunity and more capacity within our, our health care system and our hospitals. Because we understand when we take those regularly scheduled um, more routine surgeries into communities Response. closer to where people live, it gives more capacity in our public health system. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.